بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ونبيك ورسولك النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا So last week we started the the story of the uh, the owner of the two gardens and just before that what i wanted to say is that uh, this surah is again really an amazing surah because what it says to you is that you have a sanctuary you have a safe place you have a cave that you can come to always in your life no matter what your situation is no matter whether you're married or not married no matter whether you're uh, a student or you're working whatever your situation is you have a cave the door to Allah's cave is always open for you and this is one of the amazing uh, uh, symbolisms of this story so that door is always open all we need to do is just step inside and it's always that and once you step inside the amazing thing is is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes care of your affairs for you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manages your life for you and this is the amazing thing about this this sim- the symbolism of this story and also the the, the 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 nature of this religion that you can rely on the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you can rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take care of you take care of your affairs and that's why we say hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil Allah is sufficient for us Allah is enough for me wa ni'mal wakil and and, the, and he is the best of uh, disposers he is the best disposer of affairs and so this is um, this cave is always there for us to enter any moment of the day and so why go to other caves when the cave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there and so how do we find this cave how do you first you have to find this cave and, the, and we talked about this last week but I didn't put it in this way the way you find this cave is Iman you, ha, you, you have Iman you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you, you come to the cave but the way to enter the cave is Islam uh, so as I said last week Islam is not an identity it is not a culture it is not a belonging it is not a a cloth it is not an image it is not something that you have been born into that is not Islam Islam is a state Islam is a way of being Islam is an attitude Islam is a decision if you like and that decision is a continuous decision it is not just a point in your life where you say I'm a Muslim and therefore I'm now I've crossed the line it is not a line that you cross Islam if you like is a line that you have to cross every single second of your day and that and and if we do that then we are Muslims then we are Muslim this is the and this is the sense in which the Quran talks about Islam and the same with Iman it is the same Iman is not a word that you say and that's it you're a mu'min Iman is something that you have to do continuously during the, and it's and it's in that sense that the Quran talks about the believers the Quran doesn't talk about believers who cross the line the Quran talks about believers who um, you know who who um, who become people who are true to that 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 belief that revelation every moment of their of every moment of their day so this is the way to enter into the cave it is to submit to the command of Allah it is to submit to the revelation of Allah in your life so as I said last week if you're um, presented with a number of options if you're presented with a dilemma if you have to make a choice you ask yourself what does Allah want from me now what does my Lord what would he want from me and then to take that path whether it's easy or whether it's hard that is Islam and that is the cave and once you enter that cave and once you enter that path when once you tread on that path then it is then that you become one of the people of the cave it is then that you become um, under the under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. and then he, you see just try it yourselves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala try he starts to manage your affairs he starts to take care of whatever is happening outside the cave whether it's the storm which is raging whether there's a war which is raging raging this is this is when we enter into the uh, the protection of Allah. and this really is an amazing secret that the Quran is trying to tell us 
an amazing secret that this religion comes with. It's not a secret, but off, but it's a secret for us because we, we don't open our eyes. It's not, we, we don't open our ears. Right? And the Quran keeps on talking about Islam and Iman, but we've taken our concepts of what Islam and Iman are from other sources. And then we want to understand the Quran through those other sources. So some people, they come to the Quran through the lens of fiqh. They learn fiqh and then they come to the Quran. Or they learn philosophy and then they learn the Quran. Or they learn aqidah and then they learn the Quran. Or they learn tasawwuf and then they learn the Quran. But that wasn't the way. That is not the way. The way we learn the Quran is that we learn the Quran and then we look at everything else. So the Quran should color us from the start. And so this is the cave. This is the cave that we... And the further you are from this cave, the more intoxicated you are. The more you see things for what they're not. Because the further you are from the source of your strength, the weaker you are. And the weaker you are, the more susceptible you are to the toxicity of the allurement of life. And this life has, on its face, is, is glittery. But underneath it rots and it decays and it festers. So this is, this is it's very important to be close to this cave and not be far away from this cave. Which is why this man that we're talking about can say what he says. And which is why the Quran now says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَدَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ وَهُوَ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ قَالَ مَا أَظُنُّ أَن تَبِيدَ هَذِهِ أَبَدًا And this man, دَخَلَ جَنَّتَهُ He entered his garden. And in some tafsirs, <coughs> Many tafsirs say that he entered his paradise. He entered his paradise because this was, this is his paradise. His paradise is now on the earth. He's not going to get anything in the in the next life. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Adunya sijlun mu'min wa jannatul kafir, wa jannatul kafir." The dunya is the prison of the believer, and the uh, the jannah, the paradise of the kafir. Why? Because when you see um, this life, um, when you see that this life is nothing, uh, that it's nothing and it's limiting your potential, you want to be somewhere else. So the believer, he sees that this life is limiting him. This life is limiting his or her potential. And this life, they want to break free from. Uh, and so they want to be somewhere else. And, but the kafir, the non-believer, the disbeliever, the ingrate, he sees the prison as his palace. And this is kind of a form of madness when the criminal in prison, he sees, he starts to enjoy his incarceration. So this is why the, the Prophet wasallam. so some of the tafsir say that he entered his palace or some of the tafsir say he entered his garden. وَهُوَ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ And he is, while he was zalim, he was oppressing himself. And this oppression is arrogance. It is uh, ingratitude and self de self de uh, self delusion. Uh, he will, and this is the greatest harm a person can to them uh, can do to themselves. So wahuwa zalimun li nafsi. He entered while he was oppressing himself. Qala ma avunu an tabida hadi abada. He said he was so intoxicated. He was so. Uh, Taken away, taken about, taken away by his, and inebriated by his uh, his possessions and the allurements of his garden, he said, "I don't think, I believe that this is never going to end. I believe that this is going to last forever." You know how how can he say such a thing? How is it possible for somebody to say such a thing? He knows that things come and go. He knows that um, this garden wasn't there at some point, and then it's you know it's going to have to decay at some point, and his fruit is going to have to not be there at some point but this is the extent of what people can say what people can do when they're arrogant when they've strayed from the cave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is what they and this is why if you think about it how can you know you just imagine how can Iblis when he's worshipped Allah when he's been raised to the position of being better than any, any other angel and he's he's spoken to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he knows Allah exists just imagine you've spoken to Allah and Allah says bow down to Adam and you say no I'm better than Adam you know you created me from the fire and you created me from the fire. I'm not going to listen just imagine and you know that what awaits you you know what exists you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists you know the fire exists you know heaven exists you know all of these things 
So this is the, this is the, the, the danger of arrogance. Arrogance is, is really um, a, a very, very dangerous thing which we all should be very, very careful of. So the Qur'an is in a way teaching us that, that engrossing yourself in this life and allowing it to um, enter your heart and completely envelop your heart is a form of madness and it leads to a form of uh, madness. And one of the Mufassirs, the Mahshari, says that you will see most wealthy Muslims, even though they won't say something like this, ma uh, you know, I, I don't think ma'adhunu an tabida hadihi abada, but it's how they think and how they act. Even though they might not say it in this way, their actions speak it. And it's, and it's true, you, you see people spend their lives working so hard for something that's going to leave them. They spend their days and nights, you know, many, many, many hours. Sometimes people take two, three jobs, right? For what? For something that's not going to last. Does it make sense? And it can only be because they feel in their heart of hearts, somewhere deep down, subconsciously, that they feel that this life is a very, very long life and it's, it's, it's endless. So this man, he thought this was not, never going to end. Uh, and you know, Spain, Andalusia, that was called paradise. They used to call it paradise, but it had to end. Anything, any power that comes, anything that goes up must come down. You know, the, the uh, Mughal rulers, the Mughal rulers of India, ruled for 300 years and they were extremely powerful. But then they fell and their wives became uh, prostitutes and they became beggars. The rulers of India, you know, the jewel of the crown of the British Empire, it was so rich, so uh, had so much glory, had so much, the riches of the world were in India. But when the Mughal Empire fell, this is what happened to the, the rulers. Same with Burma. In Burma, the Muslims were very rich there. They were extremely rich people. And actually, once Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi, he went to this country and he warned these people. Because these people, you know, they were, again, this the same thing that happened. The same thing, they were <coughs> carried away with their businesses. And he said to them, I, if you don't realize why you're here, why you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent you people, I fear that one day you'll be thrown out from this country. And this is exactly what's happening now. So Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi rahimahullah ta'ala said this and he predicted this and this is what, what happened. So, so next uh, he says وَمَا أَظُنُّ السَّاعَةَ قَائِمَةً وَلَا إِرُّدِتُ إِلَىٰ رَبِّ لَأَجِدَنَّ خَيْرًا مِنْهَا مُنْقَلَبًا He said that I don't think that the hour will ever come. I don't believe that the hour is ever going to come. I don't believe in the day of judgment. I don't believe in the last day. I don't believe that I'm going to be judged. So this is what he's feeling. This is what he actually now feels because of what he has, this overconfidence that he has. And if I am, if, if for the sake of argument, even if I'm raised, I think that I'm going to be given better than you, than what you have. I think I'm going to be given better than what I have now. So this is again extreme arrogance. So this is how, remember he's, he's arguing this with the believer. He's having a discussion. So now he's so confident of himself, so, you know, this is complete arrogance that he makes a statement and he completely, uh, you know, believes in this, that I don't believe that the, uh, the judgment, and even if I am, even if there is a judgment, as you say there is, I think I'm going to be given better than what I have now. So, you know, there you are, there you are, you know, take that type of thing. Um, so on what basis, who guaranteed this for you? Who, who gave you this, 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 uh, this promise that you're going to have more? So these are just false hopes. He thinks, this man thinks that he has some kind of uh, position in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes. And he was given this garden or these two gardens a bit with the fertile land between and the nakh, the, uh, the date palms around because he was deserving of them somehow. So he believes he has istihqaq. You know, he believes that he deserves that he's special, this is why he's got these things. And as we said last week, that people who have things in this life, uh, the favors of Allah or wealth or some gift from, any gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mean that you are special. Because we know that this life is a test. So whatever people are given, whether it's good or bad, is a test. And it doesn't mean anything beyond that. That's all it means. It just means test. Uh, it just means that it's a test. And uh, so 
the next verse is قال له صاحبه وهو يحاوره أكفرت بالذي خلقك من تراب ثم من نطفة ثم سواك رجلا his companion the believer he said to him while he was discussing with him while he was while they are having this um, this uh, this discussion أكفرت بالذي خلقك have you denied have you disbelieved in the one who created you no you didn't come from nowhere you came from somewhere somebody created you have you disbelieved in 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 him you do you think you came from nowhere do you think you just spontaneously appeared in 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 this world khalaqaka min turab who created you from dust thumma min nutfa and then from from a despised drop of food from a drop of sperm and then he created you he fashioned you into a, a man just think who you were where did you come from you were nothing you were a despised drop of fluid did you make yourself grow into a man no you didn't and actually this is one of the best things to do when with um, when somebody's arrogant the best thing to remind them of is their weakness and their origin and their need that they have to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best thing to remind them is where you came from. You are nothing one day. هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينُ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٍ مَذْكُورًا Has there not come upon man a time when he was nothing to be mentioned? This, this is one of the best things to remind people who, who have arrogance that one day there was a time where you had nothing. You had none of this strength. You had none of this beauty. You had none of this education. Do you think, you, do you think it was because of you? That you, is it because of you that you're here in this university? Is it because of your intellect? Is it because of your hard work? The Quran is saying, it's, no, it's not. It is Allah that is giving it to you. And Allah can take it away any second. It is really, really, really important to remember that whatever we have, whatever we think we have, whatever we think we've been blessed with, never be, never be, never be um, arrogant about that. Never have pride about that. And never think it's because of you that that's, that, that's there. You can do it. The moment, the moment that somebody thinks like that, that is one of the sure way guarantees for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then to take that, take that away from, the, um, from that person. So this is really, really uh, very important that we should be grateful for anything Allah has given us. For anything, anything, any knowledge, any ability to speak, any confidence, uh, any, uh, anything, any, any, uh, our families, the fact that we're here in this country, the fact that we're in this university, anything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, it's because Allah decided to give it to us. And Allah can easily take, and often, very often, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does take away. Why? Because He knows us better than we are. And sometimes, what we find is that when Allah takes away things from us, we improve, we become humble. But when Allah gives to us, we become arrogant. And this is one, one of the reasons why Allah sometimes sends loss our way. Because He teaches us to be humble. So it's, it's important to be humble before any of that might happen to us. So this response was from this believer was very good. It was an excellent response. It tells you that this believer is a learned person. He's a knowledgeable person. He knows how to respond to these things. Right? And it shows you he's not ignorant and it also shows that his belief is strong. His belief is very strong. You know, do you, do you, do you disbelieve in the one you know, who, um, who, who created you from nothing? So he's got knowledge and uh, you know, he's not ignorant. So then he says, but as for me, as for me, it is Allah who is my Lord. And I will not associate anyone with my Lord. So he says, my Rabb, my sustainer, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one I rely upon, the one who's given me everything, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will never associate anyone with Allah, with my Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَوْلَا إِذْ دَخَلْتَ جَنَّتَكَ قُلْتَ مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ لَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ إِنْ تَرَنِي أَنَا أَقَلَّ مِنْكَ مَالًا وَوَلَدًا Why, when you entered your garden, 
didn't you say Masha Allah la quwwata illa billah whatever Allah wills will be there is no power and no strength but with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you see me less than you in wealth and sons so again this is you know um, really this is you know you can see that this man is not he's not jealous he's not jealous he's not saying this out of jealousy or he's not he's, he's trying to guide this man he's trying to you know uh, bring this man back to his senses because he's lost his senses so this is you can see that this is what this believer is doing if you see me less than you in wealth if you see me less than you in sons why didn't why didn't you say why don't you say masha allah la quwwata illa billah instead of saying that i don't think this is ever going to perish and i am better than you in wealth and i am better than you in 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 sons more more number i have more number than you you should be thankful that allah has given you more you should have remembered allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is what this is a a, a good piece of advice and um malik radiyallahu an he used to write um he, he wrote the verse masha allah la quwwata illa billah on his house and people asked why did you do that and he said dari jannati my house is my jannah my house is my garden so this is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us my my house is my place of sanctuary so i write Masha, so he wrote masha allah la quwwata illa billah and also it's reported that urwa ibn zubair whenever he entered his garden he used to have a garden he used to say, Masha Allah la quwwata illa billah. And he used to keep on repeating it until he left. And then when it, uh, when it was the time of harvest, uh, it said that he uh, used to make a hole in his wall so that anybody who wanted to enter, he would come in uh, and then take uh, fruit and how much they wanted and then leave. So this was Urwa ibn Zubayr. فَعَسَىٰ رَبِّي أَن يُؤْتِيَنِي خَيَّرًا مِّن جَنَّتِكَ وَيُؤْسِلَ عَلَيْهَا حُسْبَانًا مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ so this believer, he now says, perhaps my Lord will give me better than your part, than your uh, garden. وَيُرْسِلَ عَلَيْهَا husbana, And perhaps he will send upon your garden husbana. Husbana is adab. You know, bala muqaddar. It's uh, punishment. مِنَ sama from the sky. فَتُصْبِحَ سَعِيدًا zalaqa, And perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it into a slippery land, make it barren basically. You know, destroy your garden. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you, um, because of what you've said, because of what you think you are, because of, you know, all of this arrogance and non-thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perhaps my Lord will do this. أَوْ يُصْبِحَ مَاؤُهَا غَوْرًا فَلَن تَسْتَطِيعَ لَهُ طَلَبًا Or perhaps... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make this river that flows the water of your garden ghawr uh, ghawr means to disappear basically make it disappear فَلَن تَسْتَطِيعَ لَهُ طَلَبًا and then you will not be able to make it return so basically you know maybe this will happen maybe because you're arrogant Maybe because you're not thankful. Maybe because you think you're somebody. Maybe because you think you're better than all these other people. You're better than me. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will decide to remove everything that you have. Remove the source of your pride. Remove the source of your arrogance. Who knows? Allah can do everything, anything. So what happens next? What happens next is this. فَأَصْبَحَ يُقَلِّبُ كَفَّيْهِ عَلَى مَا أَنْفَقَ فِيهَا وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَى عُرُوشِهَا وَيَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أُشْرِكْ بِرَبِّي أَحَدًا so This is what happens next. وَأُحِيطَ بِثَمَرِهِ his, his crops, his gardens were destroyed. They were encompassed, encompassed by ruin. فَأَصْبَحَ يُقَلِّبُ كَفَّيْهِ He started to do this. He started to turn his hands. You know, it's a expression of regret. You know, when some, you know, um, it's an ex expression of regret and uh, hasra and nadama. You know, when you're when you completely uh, enter into a state of profound regret of of not having done something or, or for having done something. فَأَصْبَحَ يُقَلِّبُ كَفَّيْهِ like this عَلَى مَا أَنْفَقَ فِيهَا over what he had spent. 
over all the money he had spent, all the money, maybe he spent all his money on this. He bought this oasis in the desert with everything that he had. And, and over all the, the time that he had spent, over all the effort that he had put into this, 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 um, this basket of his, over maybe many, many, many years, maybe 20, 20, 30, 40 years of his life, all gone in a second. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it away. وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَىٰ عُرُوشِهَا And this, uh, his uh, vines, his grapes, fallen upon their trellises. You know, the trellises are the things which keep the, the vines up, which hold the vines up. You know, the uh, people who have vineyards, they use wooden structures to keep their vines up. وَهِيَ well, uh, uh, And the grapes, خَاوِيَةٌ Fallen upon Urushiha, upon their trellises. And then he said, Would that I would, would that I had not um, associated anybody with my Lord. So is is this man now repenting? The question is, is he repenting now or not? You know, so some of the tef- some of, some people say yes, he repented. And some people say, no, he's not repenting, he's regretting. He's regretting that he, if he, that he's regretting his garden. You know, he's regretting that if he had not done shirk, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have destroyed his garden. So he's regretting because his garden's gone, not because of what he's done, not because of, you know, not because of um, his shirk and his kufr. Just like um, uh, Qabil, Qabil, when he killed his brother, uh, he asbaha min al nadimin. He became one of those who regretted. But it wasn't that he regretted, he wasn't that he made tawbah, he regretted because of certain things that happened in the story. So it's not, it's, this is not tawbah, this is regret. And this is, this is uh, an important thing to remember that anybody who's arrogant, will one day become humiliated in this life. This is a sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anybody who becomes arrogant will, uh, will one day be humiliated. And arrogance is, at the root of arrogance, is a belief that whatever you have won't go. And at the root of arrogance is a belief that whatever you have, number one, won't go, and number two, it's because of you that it happened. It's me that made it happen. This is one of the roots of arrogance. And this is why arrogance cannot fit with Iman. Because a mu'min, a believer, is somebody who deeply feels that everything he has, everything he can do, everything he's been given, at, at any minute can be instantaneously be removed, just like this man. So this man, he relied on himself, and so Allah left him to himself. Okay, so you think it's you that has achieved all of this and it wasn't from us, so protect your garden. Protect the things that you revel in. Since it's your doing, make it carry on. And this man, he did not have anybody that could help him besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he could not defend himself. He could not defend himself. As opposed to what he said before. He said that, I am stronger than you. Izza is strength. Izza is might. And so he was boasting about his might. He was boasting about how much strength he had. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he had nobody that could help him. Nobody that came to his, his, um, his, uh, his help. And you know, one of the things that we see here is that time and time again we see you know, this man could have easily have opened his eyes and could have thought nothing lasts forever isn't that an obvious thing to, to realize but one of the lessons of history is that people don't learn from history the biggest lesson of history is that people don't learn from history and this is unfortunate this is what this man uh, this is what he fell into uh, you know there are and there are many, many rulers and many, many people throughout history who've fallen fall into this trap. Uh, Indra Gandhi was a very arrogant woman. 
and she was, uh, you know, really very, very haughty and arrogant and proud. And ultimately, it was her own bodyguard who killed her. The very person that was paid to protect her, he was the one who had taken her life. And again, so again, Allah can take your protection away at any at any point, at any point. Another another example, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, Ali Bhutto, who was the who was the uh, president of uh, Pakistan. He was a very very arrogant man, and his uh, close friends used to call him Zulfi. And one day somebody called him Zulfi, who wasn't a close friend of his, and he said, and he replied like this: He said, "Because I sleep with your wife, you think you can call me Zulfi?" You know that was the arrogance of this man. You know, he said, it was a very dirty thing he said to this man. And once he was being interviewed by somebody, uh, he said, do you know who you're interviewing? Do you know who I am? I am the most powerful ruler in Asia. This is who I am. This is who you're interviewing. So again, huge, you know, really, you know, you can really see how some people become, can become very arrogant if Allah gives them money. And actually when people, when Allah gives you so much that you become arrogant, it's a sign that Allah's now doesn't love you. It's a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is leading you to your doom. You know, so people who are arrogant should really wake up. They should really wake up and, and understand that that they, if this if these things that Allah has given you are making you arrogant, then you then it's because Allah is leading you to your to punishment. And this Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, he was um, he was destroyed and he was crucified by Zia al Haq. You know, Zia al Haq, the president of um, the, uh, the uh, Pakistan. Huna lika al walayat ulillahi al haq. Huwa khayrun thawaba wa khayrun uqaba. There, the only protection come from, comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the true one. He is the best to reward and the best to give success. I.e., for the true believers, Allah's protection is always there. So seek your reward and success in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in, in this story, and this is the end of the story, what he's trying to say is that if you want protection, come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's trying to say that anything that Allah has given you, anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted you, then always remember that that has come from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never, never forget that. And the moment you forget that, you become ungrateful. And the moment you forget that, and the moment you think that it's me that has this, and you, the moment you become overconfident, the moment you become overconfident and you, I, you know, I can do this. You know, I've, I've got this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that very moment might very well take that thing from you. And this has happened to many, many, many people. Many, many people. You think you're intelligent and you become arrogant or you say something, you know. At that moment, Understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, 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 very soon will take that away from you. You think that you can, you know, run, you're very energetic, you're very healthy. You know, very quickly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send any illness upon you. So this is really a very, very important message, very, very important for anybody. If at any point you see something that you like about yourself or that you have something, immediately the Quran is going to say, Masha Allah, la quwwata illa billah. Masha Allah la quwwata illa billah. It's very, very important. This is one of and the what many and many of the Salaf used to say this when they used to, um, you know, see something that they were happy about, uh, you know, or they were um, pleased about about themselves or about something that they had. They used to say this word, Masha Allah la quwwata illa billah. So this surah is all about. If you if you uh, remember what we said last week, this surah is all about what. It's all about placing our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and removing our reliance on ourselves. Right? This is why in the previous story, the Prophet was told to say, Insha'Allah. Don't say, I will do something tomorrow except by saying, Insha'Allah. Right? Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remove your reliance on yourself and put your reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the same here. If you see something that you have, say MashaAllah. So remove the reliance that you have and put your reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is, um, this is the, um, the, um, um, one of the main points of this surah and one of the main points of this story. And as we said at the beginning of this story, this is a warning from, for Quraysh. 
that soon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might take away your power, soon Allah might take away your honor, and soon Allah might take away your wealth and your dignity that you have. And this is exactly what happened to the Quraysh. This is exactly what happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a conqueror into Mecca and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the, the final victory. And this is what it means, wa khayrun uqba. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best to give success, the final success. Uqba, uq is uh, finality or is the end of anything. It means aqiba. It means um, the final success. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives the final success to those who enter His cave. So this is really, again, you know, this is the way to um, achieve um, uh, success, which is humility, which is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to remove reliance from ourselves and to put reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll end, we'll end it there, inshallah. We'll stop there, inshallah.